Javante Tank Davis is currently one of the most recognizable faces in all of boxing. Possessing incredible knockout power and a perfect 29-0 boxing record, he has held world titles in multiple weight classes. His cerebral finishing ability and aggressive attitude has a lot of people comparing him to a miniature Mike Tyson. What do they think? What do you think about them comparing to you? And you're a legend, my friend. Well, he'll be one too if he keeps fighting. But being that he's popular enough to call himself the face of boxing without anyone taking it as a joke, it's safe to say that the name Tank Davis is big enough to stand on its own. As of 2024, the brand of Tank Davis is one of the most commercially and financially successful ones in all of boxing, standing shoulder to shoulder with Saul Canelo Alvarez. It's so successful, in fact, that a lot of people say that Tank's popularity outranks his actual achievements. Pointing to several different instances where it seemed like Tank was avoiding the best competition in his weight class and getting preferential treatment based on who he is and who he's associated with. And in this video, I'm going to break down how and why Tank's career has been fully constructed from the jump to minimize risk and maximize reward. But before we get into how Tank was favored, we have to ask ourselves whether or not Tank deserves to be where he's at based on his actual talent level, and the answer to that is a resounding yes. A tricky southpaw with high ring IQ and the type of power in both hands that you can only be born with, Tank clearly passes the eye test. And before he ever set foot in a professional boxing ring, his natural skills and abilities have been systematically honed and developed at Baltimore's Upton Boxing Center by coach Kenny Ellis and coach Calvin Ford. The two have worked with Tank since the young age of seven. I'm bringing this up because it means everything to who Tank is as a fighter today and to fully comprehend that you have to understand who coach Kenny and coach Calvin are. They're two people from two opposite backgrounds that together created an environment that's perfect for developing raw talent of children from the violent streets of Baltimore. Kenny Ellis came from a stable two-parent household and learned boxing in the gym. While Calvin Ford grew up on the crime-laden streets of Baltimore and learned to box in the federal penitentiary where he did 10 years for drug racketeering and conspiracy charges. For fans of HBO's The Wire, he is the inspiration behind Cuddy, the legendary soldier in Baltimore's drug trade who became a boxing trainer upon coming out of prison. How much money are you talking about? Ten thousand. <laughs> See, go through all that for 10,000? Man, Slim, go get him 15,000 cash, man. But instead of approaching Avon Barksdale to help get him started, the real life Calvin Ford approached Marvin McDowell, a respected boxing trainer in Baltimore running the Umar program. And unlike Avon Barksdale, McDowell declined to assist him. However, the conversation was overheard by Kenny Ellis, who at the time worked as a coach for Umar Boxing. Kenny took the kids he was training and went over to help Calvin with the kids that he had. And from that, the Upton Boxing Center was born. Ever since then, the two have been best friends and consider each other to be brothers. Calvin the nickname Kenny the Bible as he views him as a moral compass, somebody that represents all of the right in his life. And the collective philosophy at Upton Boxing Center ever since its inception has always been it's all about the kids. And the selection for training is an old school one that begins with a test to see if the kid truly wants to fight. Coach Calvin will stick a newcomer in sparring with a kid of a similar age that has been training and if he comes back the following day, he'll take him on as a pupil. As you can imagine, seven-year-old Tank passed his test with flying color. He definitely wanted to fight, but he was initially very reckless and aggressive, and the two coaches channeled that energy and focused it with discipline. And this developed him into a three straight times national silver gloves champion with a 221 and 5 amateur record. By the time he caught Floyd Mayweather's attention and entered the pro ranks, he was already a refined, mean fighter with huge power and tenacity. But that wasn't all that discipline did for him. It also kept him out of the streets, while a lot of people that trained with him at Upton, unfortunately, weren't so lucky. The walls of Coach Calvin's office are filled with names of fighters that could have been great but ended up passing away due to senseless violence. One of those names is his own son, Quadir Gurley, who was fatally shot in July of 2013. Tank posted a post a couple days ago and he gave tribute to all the people who passed away. Who were some of the guys that he posted? Do you remember? Man, it was Baby oh, Frank. Rock. Baby Frank. Man, man. Uh, man, Diddy. Who was who some um, of these? My son, Kadir. Um, uh, other fighters. Top. What's they were name? top, top fighters? Top. What's his name, Top? Some of them was just before 10. Yeah. Wow. A lot of them was before 10. Yeah, they were good. I didn't know how many guys that's Tank was that's around. champions. That Tank was around, and, and that's where his pedigree came from. National champions, man. 
Baby Frank wasn't a fighter, but he was but the he, nicest he was person. The glue. Always smiling, he always was friendly. He was the glue. Lorenzo Simpson's uncle. Yeah. I ain't lying. It was times I called him. He just said, <laughs> You started this shit wrong with you. Yeah, he was the best. Always happy. I never seen him in a bad mood. Yeah. yeah. Stacy Day. And what, what happens? So they get involved in something in the street, people just random or a mixture of everything? It's that life, man. You just don't know. It's that life. It's that life. There was one kid, I think he was just a good kid, just minding his own business. Last year. Last year, uh, that was Red Man. Uh, he was going to prom or something? Yeah, he, but, uh, but he, what came, he, he, he came from his prom and they killed him. For no reason. Yeah. Shame. So, so. Yeah. But I look at all the deaths, man, let them go in vain. Tank told, Tank told me it was a lie. No, he's seeing death. I was sitting in the office the other day doing the interview, and I'm looking at all the pictures in the office. And I said, I said yo, sure, he's seen a lot. Tell, tell me, that's his name. Tank is special, both in ability and the fact that he was able to make it to the pros while avoiding the death and incarceration that seemed to surround him in Baltimore. And navigating the minefield that was his childhood in combination with being guided by Floyd Mayweather in the early part of his professional career gave him the reason and the resources to take a very safe approach in picking fights. Like it or not, Tank is not a fighter that jumped straight into the fire and took on all comers. He meticulously avoided matchups that could have been challenging. And today, he's only been the underdog once when he fought Jose Pedraza for the IBF Super Featherweight title when he was 22 years old. At the time, Pedraza was a young, slick, undefeated boxer and it was a legitimately impressive victory for Tank that highlighted his potential. But that ended up being the only title that he won from an actual champion. He avoided fighting Devin Haney for the WBC title to instead fight 37-year-old Eurokas Gamboa for the vacant WBA title. Besides being old, Gamboa at that point had already been knocked out by Terence Crawford and was developing a reputation as being a fighter that was not able to take a good punch. He lost the IBF title that he won from Jose Pedraza by missing weight by two pounds against Francisco Fonseca. When presented with the option to weigh in in two hours, he refused, opting to take the weight advantage over the belt, not unlike what Ryan Garcia recently did against Devin Haney. And in his next fight against Jesus Coelar, he was essentially gifted a WBA super featherweight title. Not only was the fight for the vacant title, it was also for the regular version of the belt as the WBA already had a super, super featherweight champion in Alberto Machado. But the WBA downgraded Machado to regular champion and upgraded Tank's fight to the super version of the title. So when Tank won, he was given the main version of the championship without having to fight the actual champion that held that title. And the WBA never gave an explanation for why they did this, but in my opinion, there's only one real explanation and that is that Tank was a much bigger name and much more marketable so the WBA wanted him to be their champion. You see how dirty boxing can be? So even though Tank oftentimes gets listed as a multiple weight class world champion, he only really legitimately won one title. And the fighters in his weight classes that he's often going back and forth with in the media and on Twitter are not only much more accomplished than him on paper but also several years younger. Tank is going to be 30 years old this year. But comparison should course Stevenson is 26 and has held world titles in three different weight classes including unified and lineal titles as super featherweight. Devin Haney is 25 and also held world titles in several different weight classes and was the undisputed lightweight world champion. Teofimo Lopez is 26 and again has held multiple world championships in two different weight classes. The latter two also defeated Vasil Lomachenko who Tank has avoided his whole career. And while Devin's victory over Loma is questionable, he did fight him when he was only 24. And Teofimo Lopez definitely beat him at an even younger age of 23. And Shakur Stevenson has been asking to fight Lomachenko for years. I'll fight anybody, but as of right now, I'm trying to fight Lomachenko. Are you, Are you fighting in the I, I, I like that fight. I love that fight look, 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 look. Remember everything that everybody was saying. Oh, I'm, I'm this, I'm that. Remember. So after I watch him, when I, when I smoke him, I want to hear what everybody said there. Meanwhile, Tank at that age would go quiet whenever Lomachenko's name was mentioned and the reply from his camp would always be that he's not ready and that there is no rush. Lomachenko has to fight as many fights as possible extremely quick because he's very, very old. Tank is probably 10 years or 11 years 
younger than Lomachenko. Lomachenko will be 40 before you know it. There's no rush tank. Your job is to continue to go out there and do what you're doing. You make it, he's making, you making the same money Lomachenko is, is making. And you're doing it easier. This kid is still young. There's no rush. We're gonna take our time. But one thing I wanna say is that we're not ducking or dodging any opponent. And you're doing it easier. Eventually we, we, we'll get to whatever name we have to get to next. But right now we're not throwing no certain names out there, but we're not ducking or dodging. Because one thing we do know, no matter who Tank fight, he got he has an equalizer that can, that can change the fight in a heartbeat. And you're doing it easier. And when him and Mayweather were having problems and Floyd went out and publicly said that he was going to make Tank fight Lomachenko next, Tank said that he was trying to set him up. Me, we want to see you fight Lomachenko. Mm -hmm. We want to see you fight Devin Haney, Teofimo Lopez, all the top who they say is the four horsemen and they anywhere around your weight class. We want to see it happen. When we going to see it happen? I'm not sure. I don't, that's like. How many times you don't want in there and said, I want these, man? To be honest, I ain't never said it. And only now that Lomachenko is 36 years old, did Tank start dropping his name, knowing full well that if they do fight, Loma will likely be close to 40 years old. Earlier in the week, you mentioned Javante Davis and you mentioned how you would fight him for free. Obviously we know, you know, you wouldn't actually fight him for free, but what are your thoughts on Javante Davis and a possible matchup? Because many people- Ask Floyd Mayweather. He said the kid isn't ready yet for the fight. Floyd Mayweather is his promoter. Floyd Mayweather, of anybody junior, knows about boxing. The question of whether Giovanni Davis is ready to fight a master like Loma should be put to Floyd Mayweather Jr. Let him answer that question. But Don't ask stupid stuff about Giovanni Davis when his promoter says he's not ready. But you know, I think Geronta Davis, he's best of the best uh, fighter in the Twitter. And you're doing it easier. Take a fighter with some name recognition that once would have been a legitimate threat and fight him when he's way out of his prime. Exactly what Tank did with Eurokas Gamboa. Besides Pedraza, the two somewhat notable wins that he has are plagued by outside factors and conditions. Leo Santa Cruz was way too small for 130 and still managed to give Tank fits in some parts of the fight. Brian Garcia was subjected to a 10 pound rehydration clause and looked like a corpse fighting at 136 pounds. Simply put, Tank is not challenging himself or taking any risks at all. And even fighters like Gary Russell Jr., who himself only fights once a year, if that, are starting to call him out. What'd you make of, of Tank and, and Barrios and him moving up to, to fight a guy like that? I thought it was a very... <sighs> I thought it was a, a strategic fight that all... It, it was strategized and it almost backfired it was a real strategy fight and it almost backfired they they're cherry picking they cherry picking what i mean by that is they picking the 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 easiest task or whoever they feel as though the easiest task or the easiest fight is and fighting that person. Instead of focusing on accolades, he's focusing on building up his profile and fan base with every single fight. He understands that casual fans don't care about titles, but more so exciting fights with big names. So he either picks fighters with the biggest name recognition that he can and fights them under conditions that make them vulnerable by being the A-side, like Ryan Garcia, Roly Romero, or Lomachenko if he ends up fighting him in a couple of years, or he chooses fighters that are way below his level that he can just knock out spectacularly to create an exciting fight. Broly Romero actually falls in both categories. I don't think he's not, he's not like, he's an awkward fighter. Awkward is someone, I don't want to call no names, but um, awkward is like different from him. He's not awkward. We know awkward fighters. Real fighters know awkward fighters. He's not an awkward fighter. He's just a dumb ass fighter. <laughs> He also wants to diversify the backgrounds of his opponents to capture different fan bases. For example, Ryan Garcia with Mexico and younger fans, Jose Pedraza with Puerto Rico, Roly Romero with re ridiculous people. But all in all, it's about protecting the zero at all costs, doing the most with the least, and taking calculated risks only when necessary. In other words, it's the classic strategy used by every single fighter advised by Al Heyman. And just like Floyd Mayweather before him, Tank is one of those fighters. And Al is probably guiding him in the same exact way that he guided Floyd, because just like Floyd, Tank could always be built into a superstar. And the advice he gives is probably something like, 
you're the A side. Let fights marinate. It doesn't matter. Fight them on your terms. At the end of the day, it's all about the paycheck. And it's hard to fault him for that because at the end of the day, for the fighter, when everything is said and done, it really truly is. To fans, they're warriors, icons, gladiators, superstars, but in reality, they're just regular people and boxing isn't who they are. It's just something that they do to make a living. And it takes a special kind of human to want to define themselves by their fights and their legacy. And sadly, despite his talent, Tank just isn't that guy. And in my opinion, he already wasted a big portion of his prime years fighting lackluster competition. Canelo fought Triple G when he was two years younger than Tank, and by the time he was his age, he was at the peak of his career. Tank is basically 30 years old and still treating himself like a borderline prospect. Before he knows it, he'll be 35 and past his prime, and there will be a new Tank trying to take advantage of him. Because at the end of the day, there's nobody on the planet with a better record than Father Time.